Good morning in, for those in Europe and good afternoon for those in China. This is Buna Mizan uh, speaking to you for, uh, from Market Advisor, Access Advisor at the EU SME Center. Um, you have joined the EU SME Center webinar series and today we will be addressing how to control your supply chain in uh, China. Um, as usual, for those that have already participated to the webinar, I'd like to make a, a few technical checks. Uh, so uh, in uh, your, your panel, you have on the left-hand side uh, an, an indication of a hand. Please click on the hand just to show us that you're indeed uh, hearing us. So I'm just checking that everyone is hearing us. Yes. Well, we've got apparently most of you can can hear us, so this is this is quite good. Uh, we will proceed. Um, as you can, uh, well, as we've mentioned already in the past, don't uh, worry about your microphones being open. Uh, all uh, participants have been set to mute. Uh, if we feel at any point that we would like to make anyone intervene, we will ask your permission first and unmute uh, your. Uh, microphone. You have seen also on the panel that there are a number of functions available to you. Uh, one which is particularly uh, important to notice is the questions uh, part. Please use uh, this uh, this um, box to un to provide us any questions and answers you would have throughout the uh, today's webinar. We'd like to uh, collect an answer to your uh, questions. Uh, there will be some time which will be provided specifically for uh, Q&A uh, during today's uh, we webinar. We, we have already quite a few participants uh, con well, participating to today's webinar, so we won't be able to answer to all the questions. If, if that is happening, what we will do is to then uh, take your questions back, get back to you by, um, by email. Uh, or through our inquiry system on the uh, EU SME, on our website through eusmecenter.org.cn. Um, that reminds me actually that I would like to give a very brief introduction about the center uh, for those that haven't joined us in the past. The uh, EU SME Center is an initiative funded uh, by the uh, European Union. It's really uh, there to faci facilitate access to the Chinese market for European SMEs. Uh, and we do that through uh, a free first line of advice and services uh, to uh, European SMEs. This is including, uh, well, interactions with the SMEs where we answer to any questions raising on uh, technical or legal aspects, business development aspects. Uh, so really questions such as about the labor, labor costs and, and taxes, how do I set up a only for an owned enterprise, etc. Uh, we have also a number of publications available on our uh, website. I think it's useful to also mention to, to you that if you want to access to these publications, you have to be registered on the website, which uh, is rather easy. The center also provides uh, other uh, channels for uh, providing input and, and services to uh, SMEs. And we also, in our office in Beijing, have uh, free hot desking services uh, for uh, SMEs that want to explore local business opportunities. We also are increasingly more active in uh, provision of trainings, webinars, uh, well, seminars, uh, uh, and, and learning opportunities for. Uh, European SMEs, well, be it in China or in Europe, and we have uh, now an increasingly more popular uh, webinar platform, uh, and it is in that context that we've developed today's webinar on how to control your supply chain in China. I'd like to mention and to thank the uh, Benelux Chamber of Commerce, which uh, is supporting us in organizing today's webinar. We are working uh, on, uh, well, to, the USME Center has been calling on uh, the expertise of David de Klerk today to, uh, from the, the China Performance Group uh, to share his experience uh, on uh, controlling supply chain uh, in China. Um, they, I, will, I will actually pass on the floor to David for him to introduce himself, but also uh, share his experiences with us today. 
So with this, David, I'd like to pass on the mic to you. Um, thank you for introducing yourself first and then to also giving us your experiences on, on, on the Chinese market. Okay. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, my name is David de Klerk. I'm half Chinese and half Belgian, currently living in Beijing and working at China Performance Group, uh, or CPG. CPG is a full sourcing service company, which basically means we act as our client's sourcing office in China. I manage the China operations, which is where we process our sourcing and quality control. If you are interested in optimizing your current sourcing program, please feel free to visit us on our website and let us know. I also recommend signing up for our newsletter as we have a great white paper coming up in December which directly relates to this presentation titled How to Control the China Segment of Your Supply Chain. Okay, uh, let's get started. What is the China segment of the supply chain? Well, we focus on four segments of the consumer goods supply chain. The first being factory to importer, the second importer to wholesaler, the third wholesaler to retailer, and finally the fourth retailer to consumer. Expectations are that if one can buy direct from the factory, the product will be much cheaper. While in reality this is true, one must be prepared to work hard for that price benefit. Defining the China segment, if you are buying from China, the first segment of the chain is in China, and that makes it very different than if it was in, say, Antwerp. So for obvious reasons, um, there are many differences, such as language barriers, cultural differences, and the long distance. CPG is a first segment operator. The China manufacturing market. That's a quote that reminds us to know what kind of factory we are dealing with. There are two categories in China, the private ones and the state-owned ones, and they behave very differently. Most, but not all, of China's exports are handled by private enterprises. That's because they do what is necessary to get your business, but then their follow-through is not always reliable. Whereas state-owned enterprises in general are tougher negotiators, but if you manage to place an order with them, they will be reliable and deliver. Expectations. Today, with the internet at our fingertips, one feels it is very easy to buy from China. Expectations of a quick and painless results are high. It looks as simple as going online, doing a search, and placing an order. However, the realities are very different. When it is time to place an order, it is also time to pay. And then you ask yourself, do you trust the factory? Are you sure the goods will arrive the way you expect them to? Will they even arrive at all? And then your mind is plagued with these types of questions. You'll be faced with cultural differences, especially in understanding. Questions of reliability and the quality of the products, payment issues and payment terms. And these days, almost all payments are made in full before shipment can be received logistics and who handles it, and then the cost paradox, which we will go on to later, and, of course, communication issues. Okay, thank you, David. That's, that's a, a very insightful introduction. I, I, I'd like, actually, uh, to see a little bit uh, from the, the audience and the participants that we have here today, uh, their experiences, if they have any, of uh, what are the uh, segments of the um, production chain where they actually uh, have most difficulty. So with this I'd like to uh, launch the first poll which should appear on uh, your screen now. Uh, so it's interesting for us if you can provide us uh, your, your feedback 
I would like to give a few uh, seconds for that. So as you can see, the answers of the poll are finding factories, two, negotiations and placing orders, three, maintaining control of the price, four, controlling delivery, and five, controlling quality. Okay, uh, with this I'm going to, uh, yeah, a few more seconds. I'm now closing the poll and sharing the result with everyone. So clearly, David, uh, in, in the poll, what is uh, coming out of this, well, it's almost half of the uh, participants which have uh, issues with controlling the, the quality uh, as they are uh, developing their uh, supply or controlling their supply chain in China. This is probably mm -hmm. interesting for you to see, so I don't know if you have any, any particular uh, comments on that. Uh, no, um, I would expect that that's one of the biggest issues that people have a problem uh, dealing with when sourcing from China, so that's an expected result. But I think you're now going to also tell us about your experience of the, the three main uh, issues or main, main elements to, to handle and quality is definitely one of the of those ones so I, I with this I hide the, the poll and I, I let you continue with uh, with your introduction. Okay, great. Right, so as the poll shows um, quality is one of the three issues and the three essentials are price, quality and delivery. Now we call them essentials because if one of the three is missing or does not perform, then the whole sourcing program fails. Price. Price is not everything. Really, it's the value that counts. What does value mean? It means getting the right quality at the right order quantity and having cooperative enthusiasm of the factory which is another important factor to make sure that the goods come in the way that the buyer wants them and of course on time. Quality. Many importers think that quality control is about checking the order before shipment. However, quality control starts before the order is placed because that is when one determines if the factory is qualified to deliver the order as per the buyer's requirements. Rigorous attention to detail and requirements is required when dealing in the first segment of the chain. CPG, for example, has a complex quality control process which includes inspecting every single shipment. Delivery. The third essential is sometimes overlooked, but on-time delivery every time and knowing that your goods will arrive on time make a big difference in the selling of a product. Just because you have a long lead time, it does not mean that you'll be guaranteed an on-time delivery. Okay, um, thanks David. I'd just like to, to ask you something here because it's, uh, it's obviously quite interesting but if it, it would be to make this experience as well, uh, interactive as possible. If you could share maybe one one example uh, of of uh, companies you worked with and uh, share this experience with us. Sure. Uh, well, recently we did receive an inquiry from a distressed European company whose order had really gone wrong. Now, this is a chemical company that has been placing orders buying from China for many, many years. So what went wrong? Well, they placed an order with four separate suppliers. They paid for the order. And then, as their orders were arriving, uh, or not arriving for that matter, they realized that they were in trouble. So from the first supplier, they found that they received three-fourths of the goods. The other one-fourth was found unusable. The second supplier sent them the correct amount but when they analyzed the product, they found it was not even close to what they had ordered, and thus, again, unusable. Then, the third supplier only supplied 20% of their agreed upon, agreed upon amount, and the fourth supplier sent several containers, which were all 
under the quality standard and unusable. In the end, they had a loss of around 100,000 US dollars from these orders. So they contacted CPG and we did a study for them and found that all four suppliers were trading companies, not factories. And only one of the four was a legitimate business. The rest were simply fronts and fraud, really. It did not exist as real companies. I do want to note that this is a real extreme case. Usually, it doesn't get that bad. But this particular buyer had a focus on only one of the three essentials, and that was pricing. They did not focus on quality control or any guarantees for delivery. I do want to note that they were buying somewhat successfully, successfully before this because they were buying from state-owned enterprises. And this was their first attempt at buying from the better priced, privately owned sector. Okay, so. Well, maybe, maybe there I would like to also, well, um, that's quite interesting and knowing, knowing your Chinese partner, I think all your, your China-based partner is quite, quite essential and actually this is also one of the experiences of the USME Center that this can in some cases be quite a bad experience and actually this is useful to also mention one of the more recent studies that we've published at uh, the USME Center on, on knowing uh, your uh, China partner which can actually be downloaded on, on the website of uh, the center. Um, I think now you wanted to also share with us a little bit uh, the best practices uh, on, on actually uh, managing and controlling your supply chain in the most efficient way. So I pass on the mic back to you. Well, again, I would refer to the three essentials because really if you don't have a complete a grasp of these three essentials, you will eventually run into problems. So the best way would be, I mean, we could go into this a little bit further, um, but the best way would really be to have a good understanding of the three essentials, how they relate with your sourcing, and how to manage them effectively in order to make sure that you don't run into problems such as this, uh, this client of ours did. Okay. So let's go into that. Um, finding factories. So the process starts with an RFQ or request for quotation and the search for factories that can deliver. This involves pre-qualifying them and then later on perhaps auditing and visiting with them. The factory selection and comparison process never stops, meaning even when you have a supplier, you should still be on the search for others in order to have a backup supplier. Negotiations. If you have an office, uh, they should be able to handle effective negotiations. Being on site, sitting down and talking to the factory in Chinese makes a huge difference in price negotiations. And uh, there's some other um, effective negotiation requirements listed there for you. Placing orders. If you decide to buy from the first segment of the supply chain, you must be prepared to take responsibility for the quality and the details of the goods that you buy. The best approach is to think of the factory as your own factory and then realize whatever mistakes that they make, you make and it will down the line hurt your business. Controlling quality. With an office, you will be able to develop a quality control program for your sourcing. This is obtained through a rigorous process in which little is left to chance. Product specifications and quality requirements are explained in great detail. And then the factory knows that you will check every single shipment every time. So they will be on guard to make sure that they match your quality requirements. Controlling delivery. Your office should be able to aid in logistics and anticipate any problems and delays before they occur. And then plan accordingly. Controlling the details. So one of the great things about 
dealing directly with your factory, is that you're able to control the details of the production. So this means you don't have to buy off the shelf. It means you can make custom products, prototypes, develop new products, and even during the production have last minute changes. Now we like to say that prevention is better than cure. So with a good quality control process in place, you won't need to cure too many issues, only prevent them. And maintain control of the price. So the phrase, buyer is king. This is true only as long as the buyer receives competitive bids for his business from competing factories. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, David. I'd just like to, um, to again ask for the input of the, the audience here because um, one, one of the essential aspects, and we're seeing that throughout our experience at, uh, at the center, is uh, when companies decide to do and to run uh, their, their own business here or when they are actually deciding to also try to rely on local partners which have uh, um, maybe more extensive experience in actually doing uh, business in China, identifying, well, uh, controlling um, the different segments that you've, you've identified. So it'd be interesting to see, uh, again, looking at uh, the participants of today's webinar, what is their experience so far in actually uh, controlling their uh, supply chain in China. So with this, I'm launching uh, the second uh, poll, uh, which should appear on your screen just now. Uh, so it's interesting for us to identify and to understand whether uh, how you are actually uh, yourself managing your supply chain in China. Uh, one, uh, through a local branch, uh, through your own office, and you have had successful uh, results. Uh, two, same but with unsuccessful results. Uh, three, if you've been uh, managing your supply chain uh, through partnerships uh, locally or regionally. Uh, with, again, successful results or for unsuccessful results or, of course, if you haven't actually had experience yet, whether please indicate also. So we're uh, waiting for the answers. I'm giving you a few more seconds to answer. Um, okay, so it it's really seems like, uh, as I'm sharing now, uh, the results of the poll, uh, you can really see actually, David, uh, well, uh, 40% of the participants are still really exploring because they haven't had actually uh, developed this uh, mm -hmm. this mechanism in China. Um, yeah, the second largest answer, almost 30% are doing it through their own office and uh, with successful experience uh, experiences. And then here, 20% uh, through partnerships locally, also with successful experiences. Actually, altogether, we only have maybe about well, we have 17% which have had unsuccessful experiences, whether running their own or uh, local branch to control their supply chain or uh, supply chain, or through uh, uh, local partnerships. So, what is this uh, compatible with your experience, or did you did you expect different answers? Uh, no, um, I fully agree that having your own local branch is the most um, effective way, and that's uh, what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes here. Okay, so with this I'm just hiding the uh, poll answers and I give you back the mic. Okay, great. So, let's have a look at the pros and cons. Buying from the China segment is indeed challenging. Such an activity requires an on-site presence to support the sourcing program. This presence is either your own office, as we saw in the polls, or more commonly for beginners uh, using local agents. So what kind of skills are required for effective China sourcing? The following are some of the essentials. Sourcing expertise, negotiation skills, extensive industry knowledge, excellent communications, logistics support, efficient order management, and one that's not to be forgotten, Chinese language ability.
What are the pros and cons of your own office? Well, the pros are pricing. You're going to get good pricing on what you're buying because you know you're dealing with the factories. Uh, you'll also be benchmarking to making sure those pricing stays competitive. You'll have management in place to fit effectively handle the sourcing on the China side. And you're going to have direct control over the whole process. The negatives, well, it is expensive. You can be looking at up to 300,000 US dollars um, a year to run this office. Uh, you may have to deal with uh, HR issues as you start to manage the office and hire uh, staff. Who are you going to manage? Who do you trust to manage it? And finally, your office will need to develop a skill set in order to buy from these factories, which may take time. How about using a regional or local agent? As you see, the pros and cons here are almost reversed from that of having an office. So the pros, it's cheaper to start. There are no upfront costs, no overhead. And you don't need to worry about management. And then these specific agents should already have the required skill set for the products that they specialize in. The cons. Well, you're unsure of the real pricing because you only get what the agents present to you. You have very limited factory interaction and you can't be fully sure of your agent's relationship with that factory. They can be posing as the factory, but in effect, they're an agent. And then there's definitely, uh, they're definitely not going to recommend another factory unless there's something in it for them. And trust, unfortunately, can be an issue when you don't know where your agent's loyalties lie. So maybe I'd like to I'd like to ask you again, David, here, because um, I mean clearly there are, there are pros and cons. Is it, is it my understanding correct that the smaller the company or the earlier they are in their uh, development stage in China, the more they will want uh, to uh, call on the uh, uh, the services and the the uh, experiences of of agents and uh, service providers, or do you have a different experience? I would assume that as the companies are growing, they maybe want to try to run uh, well their own um, their own uh, office to to actually manage that. But uh, if you could share your experience, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in our experience, we find that many SMEs. When they start, they have this idea that, oh, China is easy. We can do this ourselves. I mean, we do it in Europe. Why can't we do it in China? It's just a different territory. So they can go to the Canton Fair, for example, or make visits to factories they find on the internet, and then start a buying program with these so-called factories, which may in fact be agents that they're dealing with. This can be successful in the beginning, but soon they will run into uh, issues. So more of the seasoned buyers, the ones that have been purchasing from China uh, for many years, usually will have an office set up in China because they understand that they need to have that presence uh, to be there to control the first segment. Otherwise, uh, something will go wrong when you're relying on somebody that doesn't have your best interest um, for, uh, at heart. Okay, thank you. So, um, so I think with this, I I will leave you to maybe make a concluding remarks and and suggestions then. Okay, sure. So, how important is it to control that first segment that we've been talking about, the China segment of the supply chain? Well, very important. As I mentioned, buyers with a lot of experience, they really know the impact of a problematic direct buying program. It will translate to lower margins, less sales, and loss of market share. So they really have to have a good control on this to make sure that does not happen. A professional sourcing office in China is not a luxury. It is a necessity. It's the best way to control the China segment 
and will give you the platform to deliver an ongoing optimal procurement program. Without a presence in China, your sourcing program will eventually fail. Okay, the cost paradox. Let me go back to what I mentioned before. The cost paradox reads, operating a well-staffed sourcing office to control the China segment of the supply chain is expensive but reduced cost, whereas using alternative approaches seems cheaper, but in the long run, it increases costs. And what are those alternatives that we're talking about? Having a Chinese or Western employee working for you in China, having a Chinese employee working for you in your home country, a special relationship with a factory, managing your sourcing through frequent trips to China, using agents or trading companies, or some kind of combination of the above. Now I'd like to point out this footnote for a special relationship, which we call the captive buyer syndrome. Now, this is a situation when the factory becomes the dominant player in a buy-sell relationship. It usually happens when a buyer relies on the same factory for its supply, year after year, and they develop a very comfortable relationship. But then the factory gets a bit too comfortable with the buyer, and prices start creeping up. At the same time, quality may often be reduced. For example, um, a potential client contacted, contacted us for an evaluation of his China supply chain. Uh, what we found was he happened to be paying 15% more than the market price. When we showed him these figures, he was a bit embarrassed and he couldn't believe that this trusted factory of his was in effect overpricing his orders. So he had become a captive buyer. Okay. So what, what, uh, what is your suggestion in these kind of, uh, of cases, David, uh, when, when companies end up in these, uh, well, uh, to become a, a captive buyer? Mm -hmm. um, in these types of situations, we would recommend establishing yourself, um, well, not necessarily immediately with another uh, factory, however, exploring those opportunities. And don't be afraid to go to the other factories, get quotations, and develop a new line with a new factory. Um, of course, working with a sourcing company to help you act as a your office in China will uh, facilitate these quickly and effectively. Um, the one thing most people are afraid of is damaging the relationship with their current factories, so they don't want to move. And they're afraid to move because they're so reliant on this factory. But then the situation only gets worse and worse. So it's better to put an end to it than to uh, keep letting it go off in that direction. So a healthy use of competition sure. on the market. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, David. I think that's you've offered us um, a good um, overview on uh, how to control one supply chain in China. I think that's uh, a lot of interesting points for food for thought. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, sure, I'm sure still that uh, the audience has a number of, of questions. Um, as you've uh, seen in the panel, there is the possibility of asking questions. We've already uh, managed to uh, collect a number of questions which, uh, which we will address uh, now. Uh, still don't hesitate to still uh, raise any, any additional questions you would have. I think we, we still have uh, capacity for, for a few more questions. Um, there is a question here that I received, uh, David, asking, uh, I can imagine that this would uh, really de very much depend on, on the sector and the industry, but there is a question on how long the whole uh, process of ordering and delivery should actually take and maybe on, on that basis whether there are some, uh, some um, particular times where a company should start to be a bit wary or worried about uh, what is happening. So what is your experience to, with regard to the question of timing in that process? So for the timing of a full, uh, from ordering to delivery, uh, like you said, it does vary with every single product, every single industry. <clears throat> the specific um, 
situation of the factory, uh, many, many other, um, other details. But in general, if you're buying a ready-made item, for example, on, in the stock warehouse of this factory, uh, it can be as little from order to delivery uh, just over a month for the processing and shipment. So that would be very fast turnaround time. But uh, if you're dealing with something like, for example, a custom-made product where you're developing with a prototype, um, I mean, very quickly I could see this happening within three months from a design, if you had a final design, to uh, confirmation of the final sample, and then to place the order, production, delivery of, say, one container. But that is very, very quickly, and I rarely see that happening. Usually with prototypes or new designs, it can take well over a year, but this is mostly due to the client um, confirming that final design. Okay, thank you. So, well, that, that will be flexible then indeed. I have here another question which, uh, which, is, which is probably useful. Uh, if, well, we, we've talked about the question of, uh, of money and negotiations and uh, good pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about, about payment methods, uh, there is a question on, on whether there are any particular recommendations on, on payment methods, whether let of credit is a common uh, payment payment method. I, I would actually like to, to add uh, to that particular issue another question which I think again we're, we're we, well, from our experience we see a lot of SMEs are facing on what is your recommendation not only on the, on the method on, but also on the, on the process. Uh, I think uh, we have a number of cases where companies are being required to actually pay almost 100% uh, of uh, the order up front. And, and uh, well, we, we've had a, it would be interesting, I'm sure you've had these kind of experiences also, and what are your recommendations on, on and possible best practices? Sure. Of course, payment is a very important, um, important aspect as it deals with money. Uh, in general, most factories now uh, don't use, usually use LCs. That's a thing of the past, but I believe it still can be used. Uh, most of our clients um, use a down payment, 30% um, or so up front, and then the remaining balance uh, after inspection, after it has passed inspection for delivery. Uh, I do want to note that um, there can be many different ways to, um, to have uh, different payments. You can negotiate different payment terms, especially as you place more and more orders with the factory and develop a relationship. But in general, you're going to have to pay for the goods in order to receive them. And if that's the case, it's not really paying for the goods that's the issue. It's getting what you're paying for that's the issue. So having a really good quality control process in place before you place the order is essential so that you don't get something you're not expecting uh, when your shipment arrives in your warehouse. Okay, thank you. Here, and here is another question, and uh, which which is also um, useful. I think that a lot of SMEs are part facing that problem on on whether you have any particular recommendation on negotiation strategies uh, with uh, with Chinese partner. You've already addressed some of the points. If I don't know if you would like to add anything mm -hmm. uh, on negotiation strategies with uh, with Chinese uh, um, providers, well, um, product providers. Mm -hmm. Um, there are many different strategies for negotiation, but really uh, negotiating is understanding the factory and having the factory understand you. Um, of course, the cultural barrier does present certain challenges, so it may be easier to negotiate if you have a Chinese representative, a person that can speak, who has the mannerisms and understands how to um, make the factory feel, let's say, uh, special and that... <laughs> that they want to take your business, and as well as um, making you seem special to that factory. And it's really creating this, this uh, relationship to get started on, to start off on the right foot. And I think many people uh, who are used to ordering from different countries uh, forego this and think, I'm placing an order, I don't need to know who they are, uh, just make it for me. And then that's, that could be the start of some of the problems that occur. 
Thank you very much, David. I can see that we still have a number of uh, questions, but to, uh, to make this uh, uh, a short interactive session, I think we're going to leave the questions for now. Don't hesitate if you have uh, actually uh, raised other questions. We, we can also get back to you uh, separately by email. If there are some questions that you would still uh, like to raise, I would like to also, again, uh, recommend that uh, you actually log into our website. We have a number of channels actually at uh, the EU uh, SME Center to actually collect your, your inquiries directly on the site through the email inquiries at eusmecenter.org.cn. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and Twitter with the same acronym, EUSME Center. Uh, but with this, I would really like to, to thank you, uh, David, for, for your input and for the, suge the suggestions that you brought uh, forward during this uh, webinar. Um, I think that was particularly um, helpful and, and useful for all uh, participants. What I'd like also to do in particular also as we're coming to the close of this webinar is to thank again the different uh, partners which have been uh, involved, including uh, the Benelux Chamber uh, of Commerce, Bencham, and you can say, actually see some of their contact details on uh, the last, this last slide, as well as the uh, China Performance Group, which was represented by David today. Uh, we're going to make sure that as we are uh, going to, um, um, as we will um, um, finish this webinar, we will put it online, uh, and well, we will um, actually make a PDF, uh, well, a, a PDF version of the presentation, so you can also uh, use all this uh, uh, this information. We will also put a um, recorded version of the webinar on uh, the website, so you should be able to actually find and refer to it in the next uh, coming days. If again any of the information that I mentioned now is not going to be uh, accessible or if there are problems for accessing, please don't hesitate to letting us uh, know, uh, be it by email or by, uh, by, by telephone. All our contact details are on our website. And with this again, I would like to thank uh, David, but also the audience uh, for uh, participating to today's webinar. We had again, as uh, in the past, uh, experiences quite a large audience, almost 60 I'm seeing here, so thank you for your participation. Uh, and I would like to ask again, as we are closing this session, you will be uh, referred to a short survey. This is uh, quite interesting for us to actually uh, collect some uh, feedback from uh, your side on how to actually uh, develop the webinar series or uh, as well as other services from the USME Center. So with this, I'd like to uh, thank everyone and, uh, uh, of course, see you at the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you.